and Islam to the originator of the monotheistic faiths, the Abrahamic faiths as they're more commonly known. Of course, we talk about kindness. Of course, we talk about ways in which we can change the world. The first 15 minutes will be available wherever you're watching this right now. But then... We will have to, just because of the nature of free speech. It's no longer even about just our alliance to our platform. It's a necessity now. You know that. Free speech is being closed down. You are not allowed to communicate independently. You are not allowed to think independently. And if you still believe you are able to communicate and think independently, that's because your communication and thought is no threat to the establishment. Press the red button. If you do that, you can become an awakened wonder and get access to all of our content, including live meditations and all sorts of solution-oriented conversation and discourse. The first 15 minutes is available wherever you're watching this. After that, will be exclusively available on Rumble. Now we have the great privilege of a conversation with Jordan Peterson, who, if you don't know, is a clinical psychologist, pending, a best-selling author, without question. He is, of course, bringing ARC to the UK to discuss a hopeful vision for a future that appears to be on the precipice of perpetual crisis, perhaps precisely because of a tendency towards centralisation, which we will be discussing at some point. Thank you so much for joining us, Jordan. Hey, it's always good to see you. I wanted to ask you, with the current set of crises that are besetting the world, perhaps most notable and extreme, at least on first assessment, being the sequence of ongoing wars and of those wars, perhaps because of historical and even historic freight, the Israel-Palestine conflict being the most notable and fraught of them. I wonder how you regard war as a symbolic event, war as a crisis. And is there something particular to be gleaned that this is in particular a war between Israel and Palestine? Does this war carry freight that other wars do not carry? If not, then why is it that Old Testament prophets use the conflict between Israel and their enemies as the kind of archetypal and defining conflict? The conflict that in fact almost could be used to understand what war in itself is. Is it even appropriate in the midst of this conflict to regard it in its symbolic terms and if it isn't appropriate why have a symbolic assessment at all well the jews are always troublesome because they're a successful minority and so that if you're inclined to view the world through a lens of power and you make the presumption that all you need to explain all of human relations and all of human history is the narrative of oppressor and oppressed, the Jews tend to stick in your throat because minorities should fail if they're oppressed and the Jews succeed wherever they are. And there's very complex reasons for that. And then if you're a right-wing ethno-nationalist, well, that's equally annoying not because the success of the Jews devastates your oppressor narrative, but because, well, the only reason they could possibly be successful is because they're conspiring behind the scenes. And so the Jews always get targeted when societies start to destabilize. I actually think they're canaries in the coal mine. You know, when you see anti-Semitism on the rise, you know that your society is starting to shake and tremble. If you can't tolerate the successful minority, then... There's something gone deeply wrong with your culture. From a clinical perspective, the idea that a patient's history, from a, from a Jungian perspective in particular, could be regarded as the intercession of God in that patient's life. Each crisis perhaps regarded as a collision with the capital S self, between the self and the ego. Do you agree with Erdinger's assessment that all human history is the manifestation of God's relationship with mankind. And if there is something to be gleaned from this very particular analytic, what is this we're experiencing now with this 
current war, uh, one aspect of which you have touched upon already, and the set of accompanying wars and crises that appear to be constellating around it? Well, it's it's hard to see how you can be Christian or Muslim without being burdened ethically by the debt that you owe the Jews. I mean, the Jews, the Jews Old Testament mythology is the starting place for Islam and Christianity. And there are complex reasons for that. I think the Jews did an unbelievably good job of formulating a monotheistic hypothesis and then buttressing that with a plethora of deep stories. But they were also among the first people, if not the first people per se, to hypothesize that the relationship with God was contractual and also psychological. So one of the things you see happening in the Old Testament, this happens with the prophet Elijah, is that there's a realization that whatever God is, which is the sum of all that is good, I suppose, that's one way of thinking about it, is also manifest within you, for example, as the voice of conscience, and that that voice is something that you have a relationship with, but that also has a certain kind of independence. Now, it's a very strange hypothesis, but it's worth taking with some degree of seriousness. I mean, Freud posited, and, and people are unconscious Freudians now, that we were religious, we believed in heaven, we believed in God to help us overcome our anxiety of death, right? To give to mortal life uh, significance and eternal significance and depth that it lacked because of its finitude. And so he regarded the religious enterprise as something that was in some ways juvenile and infantile because of that requirement for dependence. But there's a, a variety of serious flaws with that theory. And one is, well, why bother with the notion of hell then? Because you could just dispense with that if all you were trying to do was delude yourself. And the second one is, well, there are some stringent conditions that are laid upon you as an adherent of a religious belief. And you might say, well, you only abide by them because you're looking for eternal eternal heaven. But it's still the case that the religious structures are set up with a fair degree of stricture within them. And if it was a mere matter of immature hedonism, let's say, the desire for eternal gratification, why make the preconditions for membership so stringent? Then there's an additional complication as well, which is that the voice of conscience is mysterious because it obviously makes itself manifest within, but it isn't something that you have voluntary control over. And then you might say, well, is it something you have a relationship with? And I would say it, that's also an accurate way of putting it because you see this detailed very well in the story of Pinocchio. So when Pinocchio is, of course, attempting to become real instead of being a puppet, being controlled from behind the scenes. And when he first encounters his conscience, this little voice that bugs him, hence the cricket, the conscience is also not very well, well tuned. Like Jiminy Cricket is just a tramp who's been everywhere, but he doesn't have a home and he doesn't really know what he's doing. And it's in the dialogue between the two of them that the ascension to the divine occurs, right? And, and the full realization of individuality. And that, well, that's a good example of how a relationship with what's highest can be personal. Like modern people have a very difficult no time with that idea, right? It's like most educated people, if they, deign to contemplate God at all. It's as some abstract spiritual entity who really has very little to do with existence per se, kind of the God of Einstein, let's say. When 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 evangelical Protestants, for example, talk about a personal relationship with Jesus, they get pretty damn nervous and want to move out of the room, you know, the intellectual types. But they fail to understand that you have a relationship with a number of manifestations of spirit that aren't clearly yours. So, for example, the voice of conscience, that's a very good one. But the other autonomous spiritual manifestation that affects all of us is the, the appearance of what compels our interest. 
you know, there's an autonomy in that too, is that it that's summed up in the notion of a calling. You what's what what's interesting beckons to you. It isn't something that's fully under your control, right? It, you can ignore it, you can follow it, you can pervert it, but you can't fully control it. And you have to enter into a dance with it. You have to make your peace with it. And that speaks of a certain autonomy of both interest and conscience. And that autonomy seems to have a will. And historically speaking, and the Jews were very good at this, that will was associated with the manifestation of the spirit of being itself. And I think that's true. I, I don't see a more elegant definition. It's not an explanation exactly. So, well, so the Jews are freighted with all that because they were the first people to put those sorts of notions forward. And they've changed They've changed the world. And so every time they're, the Jews are involved in something, it, its significance is magnified, which is also, you know, in, in large part a mystery. So the relationship between psyche and matter requires symbolism to catharsize it and to provide cartilage that would otherwise be absent, impossible to envisage without that non-syntactical representation that symbols can provide. If uh, the conscience, uh, Jiminy Cricket, and the being, the entity, the marionette, the puppet, the boy Pinocchio, are to have a relationship at all, there, there is a kind of a tension in it, there is a polarity in it, and both of them require one another for its realization. And perhaps that's as good an explanation for uh, God creating our kind as any. When you say that monotheism is uh, the, the, the great Judaic uh, artifact, do you feel that even in a secularized culture, the, uh, the paradigm ultimately remains consistent, even if it's humanist? Tra even if this al alliance is transferred to the state, even if the pinnacle of authority and power becomes the state, is the imperture ultimately consistent? Do we, even those of us, uh, oh, and I wouldn't include myself actually, do even those who consider themselves to live in a uh, post-religious society still live within this monotheistic template, which I suppose, if it's anything at all, offers us a kind of a centrifugal point rather than a pantheonistic or pervasive or even uh, or, or a panoply of, of potential gods and deities. There is one centralizing entity and that we are and we intersect with that reality. I'd like to add to that already rather complex question, even by my own standards when I'm dealing with you, because I'm a different man when I'm dealing with you, you better believe it. How do we fold into this what advances Christianity offer us on that template, particularly if Isaiah in particular is offering us the messianic event as his key and defining prophecy? What is the function of Christianity as an advance of Judaism, and even in a secularized society, are we still operating within a kind of monotheistic template with the state, an increasingly authoritarian state, even under a liberal guise as a Canadian, you'll recognize what I'm saying there. Is that still the paradigm we're operating within? So there's two questions there, really. Okay, well, the first one, well, imagine that there's only, well, there's three options. Nothing is of any value. That'd be the first option. That's a real finalized nihilism. Now, the problem with that option is that it's it's not realistic. And in any sense, it's not existentially realistic in that it doesn't accord with our experience, but it's also not practically realistic. It doesn't accord with our experience because if you dispense, even if you dispense with all the positive meaning in life as a consequence of being nihilistic, you won't dispense with the pain and the terror. And so what you do if you're nihilistic is reduce life to pain and terror, not to nothing. And so that seems like a really bad deal. Um, and then, because pain and terror are by definition what's negative about life. So you can't elevate them to what's positive. That's not without inverting the very basis for communication itself. Okay, so then we can put that off the table. There's no life has no meaning theory because you can't get rid of the pain and the terror. So 
You could say life has no meaning other than pain and terror. You know, now that's a pretty damn dismal judgment. And I also think that's not in accord with people's experience, but at least it's more logically coherent. Okay, next. Well, there's either a unity that attempts to make itself manifest or there isn't. There's a plurality. Okay, now, if there's a plurality, what's the consequence? Well, the consequence is that you're torn apart by inner conflict. That's the psychological consequence because you're pointing in all sorts of different directions at once. Maybe you're a war of different desires, let's say, a war of different impulses. And that's a state of confusion and chaos. And we know technically that that's associated with both anxiety and hopelessness. And I say we know that technically because the most advanced neuroscientists in the world, Carl Friston among them, foremost perhaps, has already determined that anxiety indexes entropy, so chaos and confusion, and chaos and confusion demolish hope because hope is a emotional manifestation that makes itself known in, in relationship to a de defined goal. So you feel hope, and that's positive emotion. That's dopaminergically mediated positive emotion. You only feel that while you see yourself advancing towards a goal. Now, if the goals are diverse and disunified, so no monotheism, let's say, mm -hmm. then confusion reigns and so does hopelessness. Now, if the goal is unified, which implies a unity underneath everything, let's say, then another problem arises, which is, well, what should the unity be predicated upon? Now, your observation was, and this is something Nietzsche pointed out back in the late 1900s or 1800s, that it's very easy for the collective or the state or something hedonistic to become the highest unity and for everything to be bent in that direction. Well, the when the state becomes the source of unity, you have a Tower of Babel situation where people have built in a Luciferian manner, they have presumed to take onto themselves the value that should only be accorded what is truly transcendent. Then you get the collapse of the religious into the state, the failure to separate Caesar and God. You get the collapse of God into the state. Then everything that the state does becomes tinged with religious significance. And, well, <laughs> that's, let's put it this way, that's not good. And so... So that, that's how it seems to me. It's like, look, there's either a monotheism or there's a plurality. The cost of plurality is psychologically, it's anxiety and hopelessness. Socially, it's disunity, right? Because if your goal and my goal cannot be unified, then if we're occupying the same territory, we're definitely in conflict. It's the definition of conflict because we're pursuing. Now, you know, we could be walking side by side and at the moment, your pursuits and mine have nothing to do with one another. But if there is a point where what you want and I want aren't in concordance, there's either going to be reversion to power. I'll try to dominate you. There's going to be conflict of some sort, or one of us is going to give up. Uh, the alternative is to unify it. And a society is actually the manifestation of some implicit or transcendent unity. Now, you asked as well, because that wasn't complicated enough. You asked, well, what does Christianity have to offer? Let's say that Judaism didn't offer. And I'm not sure if Christianity offered more than the full realization of what was implicit in Judaism. I and mean, that was Christ's claim. He said that he was the fulfillment of the law. So the tradition, let's say, and the prophets, which was the prophetic spirit, he was the manifestation of both of those in the flesh. And I actually think I actually think that that's technically true, too, because I think the simplest explanation for what happened in the case of Christ was that he allowed or invited the full spirit that had been elaborated in the Old Testament books, let's say, and across that vast span of time to take residence within him and to become that, whatever that might mean. And when when I walked through the narrative structure and attempted to analyze what it points at, that seems to me the simplest explanation. Now, you can delve into that more deeply, because one of the things that happens in the Old Testament is 
there's a constant inquiry into the nature of proper sacrifice. And you might say, well, that's archaic. It has nothing to do with us. And it's that's that's not wise. I used to ask my students at the University of Toronto, many of whom were children of first generation Asian immigrants. I'd say, well, what did your parents sacrifice so that you could be at university? That's a lot like they didn't know what I was talking about. And it wasn't like their parents hadn't reminded them constantly of what they had sacrificed. And the sacrifice is the foregoing of immediate gratification for a medium to long term uh, sustainability and productivity. Right. And there's no difference between that and maturity. And there's no difference between that and work, because work is sacrifice. They're they're identical concepts. And work is also a contract or a covenant, because the reason you work is because You assume that you can strike a bargain with existence such that if you give up something of value now, you know, some whim, something you want immediately gratified, you put that on hold. And the reason you do that is because you can make things better, all things considered in the future and for more people by doing so. Okay, so so people are wrestling with the notion of what constitutes appropriate sacrifice all through the Old Testament. And the Christian answer to that, I mean, it's developed in the Old Testament, which is why Christ says that he's the manifestation of that spirit, essentially. The idea is that the ultimate sacrifice is your narrow self, (laughs) right? Well, that's what you do. You don't offer up your possessions. You don't offer up other people. You offer up the totality of your existence to death and to hell. And by doing that, you Well, the hypothesis is by doing that, you conquer both. And I actually think that's right because, Russell, it seems practical to me in, in, in many ways to assume that you cannot adapt to what you will not face. Now, we know in, in, psych, in the psychotherapeutic world that if you lead people into voluntary confrontation with what terrifies and paralyzes them, their characters develop and they get braver and better. Their vision expands. Their, their capacity for adaptation increases. And so then you might think, well, let's push that to its logical conclusion. And the logical conclusion would be, well, you have to face death itself and its full reality and all the torture that goes along with that. And worse, you have to face the full reality of malevolence. That would be hell. And so that's why in the Christian resurrection account, Christ faces death at the hands of a judgmental mob, right, despite being innocent, and then descends to hell itself. And so that is what we're called upon to do. You know, people say, well, do you, they say to me, you know, do you believe in God? And I would say, well, if you believed in God, no one who hasn't, no one who hasn't taken on to himself the full burden of Christ can say that he is a believer in God, not in the final analysis. You know, and you might say, well, God's mercy is such that even if we struggle towards that, we'll find our reward. And I would say there is some moral, there's something morally admirable about progress, but that doesn't eliminate the remaining insufficiency. And I, I would also say in closing to this question, look, man, it's like, Every bit of responsibility that is rightfully yours that you haven't taken on makes the world a lesser place in a serious manner. And worse than that, it turns you into a slave and it opens the door to tyrants. And that's always been true and it's true now and it will always be true. So here we are. If you're watching this on YouTube, we're going to have to leave you now. Click the link in the description. Join us over on Rumble. We talk about, this is one of my favourite moments in the conversation. I asked Jordan Peterson when he says that a kind of psychopathic energy is required in order to move out of shame and apathy, that the culture offers you a kind of bizarre, energised, innovated psychopathy as an alternative to the lethargy, the kind of larvae life that you're being sold just sit and look at your screen eat your pap when you get diabetic and sick take your medicine get on the conveyor belt to the boneyard he has an incredible take on this of course this being jp he talks about heath ledger's joker of course he talks about pinocchio of course he talks about myths of awakening and these are the times when we must discuss awakening together click the link in the description now watch the rest of this conversation you're going to love it see you over there stay free